start. I'm Professor Ian Hickey from the Brain. I'm the Executive Director of the Brain and Mind Research Institute here at the University of Sydney, and this is our information session about postgraduate programs in brain and mind sciences. And I want to talk about why brain and mind sciences. And the obvious answer is because the most important thing to do. You can tell that in a number of ways in terms of the most important thing to do in health, largely because it is in fact the largest disabling health problem in our society. If you don't just talk about premature death, but you actually talk about disability, then about 40% of total health burden in Australia is due to mental health or neurological sets of conditions. So while in our classical health systems, we spend a lot of time focused on cancer and heart disease and other sets of issues, if you're really interested in why people don't go to school, don't go to university, don't go to work every day, then what you'd be most interested in would be those classical disorders that affect brain and mind function. And in the 21st centuries, most governments, most places recognise that they are in fact the big challenges. So on the one hand, there's a big societal burden set of issues that to date we haven't made a great deal of impact on. On the other hand, it's a really exciting time to be working in those areas. That disability that you see in terms of uh, lost opportunities in life actually plays out in a bimodal or two stages of life way. And most of the studies in brain mind and science is focused on two key age groups. One's young people, so that's children and adolescents, and particularly programs in those areas. So you see about 20% of the disability in children, but up to 60% of the disabilities in those in their school and and uh, university and early working years are due to disorders of the brain and mind, things like anxiety, depression, substance abuse, etc. And then there's a very large degree of cognitive and behavioural problems associated with ageing and neurodegenerative disorders in late life. And it's really interesting, you might think that those two things have nothing in common, but in fact a lot of the processes that are important to brain development turn out to be very important to protecting against brain degeneration later in life, but also have some shared mechanisms. And a lot of the technologies and advances in brain imaging, in therapeutics, in genetics, are relevant to both sets of life. And so we're very lucky at the University of Sydney that there's been a very large investment in actually the development of the Brain and Mind Research Institute here over the last 10 years, courtesy of the university, but also of Australian governments and state governments in the development of our Camperdown campus. And recently through the Review of Health and Medical Research here at the University of Sydney, otherwise known as the Wills Review, we've decided that brain and mind sciences is one of the four principal areas that we will make our greatest investments in. And in relation to that, that means stacks of opportunity. It also means working in a quite different way, really an interdisciplinary way. These are areas in which we need people with different kinds of backgrounds. And the Masters of Brain and Mind Sciences that we've developed with support from the federal government over the last five years has been based on taking people from a variety of different backgrounds into a common training environment so that they can learn together to create different kinds of workforces in the future. So in lots of areas of medicine and health and, and various sets of science related to that, there's a tendency to become more and more specialised in a more and more narrow thing. To know stacks more about a smaller and smaller thing. We're one of those areas where we are not a single cell disease, we're not a single protein disease, we're not a single gene disease, it's the opposite. We need people who can actually be a little more divergent, who can work in an interdisciplinary way to come to terms of the complex issues of brain function and personal function in a broader society. And as part of that, we need people to train in a different way. We actually need them to train in interdisciplinary environments. So what we hope in our postgraduate program and our master's course is to have people from quite diverse backgrounds, from health or science basic degrees, coming together in the master's and postgraduate area to share their experiences and learn together to create different kinds of workforces into the future. Now, some of those will go into research. It may hopefully be research with us at the Brain and Mind Research Institute in a distant disciplinary way, or into industry or into healthcare with a much better understanding of the interdisciplinary and complex nature of brain and mind sciences and how that might apply in a variety of different fields. I'd make the general comment, I think that kind of education is hard to find elsewhere. And so we're one of those areas where the Australian government has recognised both in terms of science training, health workforce training, and then application out in the wider world. You need people who've had those kind of experiences and that lots of traditional courses don't go in that direction. So we're responding to that. Hopefully we're creating an environment in which it's really true. You can see also in terms of the onset of mental health problems, particularly in the adolescent period, why we focus them particularly strong in the area of adolescent health and adolescent mental health. Something happens at puberty. Most people are aware of the physical changes that happen at puberty. People are not so aware of actually the brain changes that continue to happen during that period. And when things go awry, the extent to which they're associated with a whole range of major psychiatric disorders. And we are the centre at the Brain and Mind Research Institute with a number of national programs, some in partnership with the Australian of the Year, Pat McGorry from 2010, the development of the Headspace programs, 
We now have a new NHMRC Centre of Research Excellence in optimising treatments for young people with depression starting in 2014 and a variety of other sets of services that are really focused on novel ways of approaching those issues. And we hope for the students who increasingly are parts of our courses that they'll have opportunities to work with those novel service environments and those populations in ways that people are not able to access in lots of other settings. Behind that lies the fundamental nature of brain development and what's really changed our understanding in recent years relates to being able to image the brain, take photos of the brain continuously over brain development. This is one of my favourite kind of reasons of why you should continue with higher education in university because your brain continues to grow and particularly continues to grow in that critical area of frontal lobes, the bit that makes you a really smart person as you go on. And it doesn't really get going until mid-adolescence and continues right through the uh, late teenage and early adult type period. But the capacity to actually study this and understand what's going on, understand the impact of that on things not just like cognitive function and neuropsychological capacity, but on things like your sleep-wake cycle and your uh, other fundamental body development, as well as kind of human development within society. And the relevance then of good things like education, social participation, and the risks associated with things like substance abuse, particularly Australia's favourite substance, alcohol use during this particular kind of period, are areas that we're deeply involved in studying on an ongoing basis. So we're very lucky to have interactions with things like New South Wales Health and other national research programs in this area focusing on the interaction between those social exposures and these fundamental brain aspects. And we try to make use of that very much in the teaching associated with our courses. We've got people who are actively involved in these research areas, their biological implications, their public policy implications, a lot of the debates that are taking place in that area, as how is it that the science might better inform public understanding. And by participating in the courses, one hopes one has an opportunity to see this right through from the basic science level to what might be the implications in healthcare or in public policy. We are very lucky that the University of Sydney has made this very large investment, and this is only like two thirds of the picture. There's a brand new other building at the back in our youth mental health area. And we're one of the few universities that's made a very significant kind of development. And it recognises the fact that the brain sciences is complex. No individual scientific discipline, no individual groups really got that kind of answer. We're also really lucky we work with a bunch of other community organisations and non-government organisations, and they're actually present uh, in the actual institute. For example, the Inspire Foundation, which is Australia's longest standing use of the internet for suicide prevention, is actually based in the basement, basement ground floor of our new mental health building. We run a large international or, um, cooperative research centre on technology use in young people through that particular partnership. In the ageing area and things of working with Parkinson's, New South Wales and with multiple sclerosis, there's a lot of dialogue with the community about what works. My favourite area at the moment is a real challenge is actually autism in young people and children and working with the autism associations and families affected by those disorders, looking at really novel therapies like the use of oxytocin, which is the hormone traditionally associated with childbirth and breastfeeding and the way in which it changes social interaction, sort of moves the way you look and how you interact with people to be nice, and the way in which that might increase what's called social cognition or understanding. We have a whole lot of basic science, intervention programs, partnerships with families, and novel brain imaging going on in that area, for, for example, as part of international trials. Constantly through the course, we hope that the people doing that, that work and being challenged by that work interact with the students in the course to say what they're doing and give the students the opportunity to see that stuff as it's actually happening in a very wider set of issues. So, in terms of who we are, I think we've got just about everybody <laughs> in these particular areas that we could think might be relevant from various sets of backgrounds. And I think that's a lot of courses at times people worry about that, about the diversity of background. We really value the diversity of background. We need health practitioners, we need people from science backgrounds, we need people from a variety of different areas, people who've had experiences themselves that are relevant to these particular areas to add to the diversity of the actual student group. We certainly need that, in fact, from a research and implementation point of view. For example, I spent this afternoon with a, with a, a woman who's a philanthropist who's backing a particular new novel forum that we're running involving scientists, clinicians, and people who have lived experiences of mental health problem, with problems with a number of other key uh, retired politicians and health policy makers as to the way in which we can foster through particular kinds of forums those ongoing dialogues. So people are much more involved in these sets of issues. The scientists are much more challenged by the particular issues that are taking place, but also those who are actually making decisions are much more informed by what the science is behind those things, perhaps a little less influenced by just their own personal opinion. So working with the BMRI gives people access to a whole range of different sets of areas. They're quite diverse in terms of those particular areas 
uh, of traditional disciplinary expertise that are relevant to trying to understand these particular areas. Um, very famously, Max Bennett, who was the foundation director of the BMRI and professor of uh, physiology here at this university, and originally approached me about getting involved with the BMRI and becoming the executive director, uh, had the idea that actually we'd leave all these names behind at the door. <laughs> we'd have everyone just disappear inside. They would need to be good at what they did, but they'd need to have a capacity to work outside of just what they had specialised in if we're going to make a difference. And that really is a big set of issues that we have. We have large teams of people, large groups of people, and actively involve the people who are leading these programs in the particular lecture series and the seminar series that we run. We've got some pretty unique kind of sets of uh, capacities. These are our zebrafish capacities, for those who don't recognise a zebrafish, which is a translucent fish that you can look through and look at the study of the development of the brain and of the nervous system uh, in, embedded, and literally embedded within the particular uh, institute. Um, we really make a lot of fuss about trying to teach in a way that is relevant to what is really going on in the labs. It's been a matter of great debate, I've got to say, in setting up these courses, because most people go to a curriculum content thing, you know, what are we going to tell you to know that you must know, <laughs> which half of us don't know anyway, or whatever it was last week isn't true next week <laughs> in a particular kind of building block type way, to really trying to work the other way around. You know, what actually is influencing what is really happening in the critical research questions that we are trying to deal with in an interdisciplinary way. I think it's fair to say in the brain sciences area, we barely know what we don't know, and we certainly know the stacks that we don't know that we don't know, in the classic Rumsfeld sense. And every, every week we are seeing things we wouldn't have guessed at as being influencing the work that we're at. And, and then hopefully through the models that we have of really dealing with the research, the unpublished research we're involved in ourselves, the commentaries that we're making on public policy, you get a chance to see that of the way in which there's a real interaction, a very fast interaction between the science and the experimentation that's going on and our willingness to participate in the wider sets of public debates. Um, and it's really interesting, it, many of the most challenging things that happen actually is to have our lecturers, who generally think they're very good, I think it'd be fair to say, Trudy, they all think they're world experts, I think you're right. and most of them are, <laughs> to some degree, be challenged by people who come from quite different backgrounds about what actually happens. So the interaction with the student group is actually very important from our point of view. And it forces people who otherwise might be very expert down a microscope or down a particular kind of thing to actually engage with the wider public understanding of the particular sets of issues. And we've been very lucky in the, in the mixtures of student groups we've had to have people come straight out of a science background and turn out to know more about the particular thing that they've just learned than somebody's supposed to know, or somebody who's working as a health practitioner or someone who's been working in public policy to actually come back and ask things in a way that really forces the teachers to actually challenge. So most of the teachers really enjoy doing this kind of work. They enjoy the particular interaction. I think it'd be fair to say, like the one I was doing on Tuesday night, we all promised to go home early and then we all go home late. <laughs> you know, because the interaction is very stimulating and helps us to see where we are going and, and to actually helps us to orientate a lot of things we do. And in that sense, we really like people who get really involved in that, who challenge the areas. There are a lot of really difficult areas in the brain and mind sciences. In fact, I was meeting with the Vice Chancellor recently in a, in a series of um, people who want to donate to the university in the dementia area. And I was prattling on about my, one of my favourite topics about early identification of dementia and then early intervention. And the Vice Chancellor was challenging me about the ethics of that. Do you really want to intervene in early and no? You know, are you really going to change the course of something bad? Because if, if you can't change the course, I'm not sure I want to know. You know, which is actually a really fundamental question in this area. And I was telling him, myself and Max Bennett were fortunate to participate in the Prime Minister's Science and Engineering and Innovation Council back in 2003, when John Howard was the Prime Minister, if anyone can remember back that long. And we were suggesting at the time the biggest challenge in the area would be one of ethics and essentially of public understanding. You know, unless the scientists in the area were able to get involved in these kind of debates, the danger would be the science would skip ahead in ways that may be unacceptable to the general public or misunderstood. And we would need to do that. And in fact, what we end up doing through our teaching groups and other things is actually having a lot of those kind of discussions about what is the wider public ramification? What does this mean to be a person? What does this mean in terms of social kind of sets of issues? And um, as I say, I just had the experience two weeks ago, had the Vice Chancellor challenging me about that exact thing. Now, hang on a sec. <laughs> And then in another debate with the Vice Chancellor, somebody who's actually at risk of Alzheimer's disease, the person with Alzheimer's disease saying, well, I don't care what either of you think, I'd like to make the decision <laughs> about the research in which I get involved. And 
from a perspective, and this is certainly a perspective of the future, the extent to which individual persons and certainly individual advocacy groups, patient groups, may well be the people who end up determining a lot of what actually happens, not independent ethicists, scientists, etc. So these are issues of really wide social implication as to where these things particularly go. And we're very engaged um, with that. So we hope, ooh, I love the way it does that, <laughs> hope it stops, yes. We hope that actually the research which draws out of these different disciplines actually comes across as trying to use all of those sets of areas together in a way that would be unlikely in other settings. You could do master's courses, you could do postgraduate courses in a number of these things individually and quite specifically, but I'd like to suggest there'd be very few in which these perspectives would come together in a meaningful way around the specific topics that we are dealing with. And so in reality, we have lots of inputs and lots of interactions with the specific sets of areas. And if you've had a background in any one of those particular areas, and you want to interact with how it comes together, having a background in any one of those areas would be great. You might have a background in something else. <laughs> that could be good too. Like ethics or philosophy or something else, that would also be good. Um, but some of these really help. But it's the capacity to understand really how they come together, <clears throat> which is what we're trying to achieve at the master's uh, level. We have a whole range of, for those who are more technically minded, we have a whole range of actually sort of technical facilities, particularly in the, in the imaging areas and important partnerships in the MRI and PET areas with ANSTO, in medicinal chemistry and a range of facilities that really lend themselves to further investigation. Lots of clinics, lots of laboratories, lots of really interesting areas uh, that are relevant to the brain and mind sciences and lots of expertise uh, in the application uh, of technologies and interventions in those particular areas. A lot of stuff with these relationships that we have and other people who are from the wider world. So we're not, it, if it looks like we're a locked away place where other people don't come in, it's exactly the opposite. It's a space that we share with a lot of other organisations. And I think, I personally find that really good. I always worry when I wander up to places like this, <laughs> which are a bit more classical university. I feel much more of when I'm down there in the BMRI, where there's much more of the community with us a lot of the time a lot of stuff happening all the time, which, which forces one to think in a different way. I was walking through a, uh, one of my office areas this morning, there's a series of older people with Parkinson's disease and a man who couldn't move, you know? It kind of stops you to think. And I had to go downstairs to the, where our Headspace Clinics is earlier in the day, and there's a very distressed young woman down there, you know? The constant kind of having to think about what is it all really about and how does this kind of play out changes the way I think constantly in which we have to think about these kind of sets of issues. We also have very important uh, people come in, give other sets of lectures, so we have a very active sort of external series and those who are part of the master's courses can get involved and attend a lot of the other seminars that we have from leading international figures and challenging ideas as part of the seminar series that are constantly running throughout the BMRO. Now at this point I'm going to hand over to Trudy to just make a few comments about the actual course work. Hi everyone, my name is Trudy Stone. I'm the student and academic coordinator for the Brain and Mind Sciences programs. I'm just going to go through some of those factual details uh, for you and then we can have some questions at the end with Ian. Um, this is just our vision, which um, Ian's touched on a little bit. It's about um, providing a program which is evidence-based research and to hopefully extend your um, clinical and theoretical knowledge. And then also to importantly produce graduates who have that knowledge and take that out into the workforce or possibly take that on to doing further research. Um, I've put a few student testimonials in here just so you can get a sense of what other students have got out of the uh, master's degree. This particular student was a clinical or is a clinical psychologist. She came in because she wanted to find out the latest kind of research into adolescent mental health and in particular ADHD. She really got a lot out of the course and now she's actually um, applied for and uh, her application's been approved to do her PhD next year uh, in um, ADHD, which is exactly what she wanted, so that's great. Um, we're just at the end of our fourth year now. We've got the graduate certificate, the graduate diploma and the masters in brain and mind sciences. And we've also got the research degrees, the MPhil and the PhD. Um, this is just the breakdown here of the credit points for those various degrees. You'll see at the bottom the Masters of Brain and Mind Sciences. We've actually got kind of two different ways of doing that. 
So if you were particularly interested in going on to do further research, um, I'd suggest the bottom uh, choice there, which has the option of the research activity, and I'll talk to you about that in a second. 2014 is going to be laid out like this. In semester one, we try and get the core units down and some electives. And in semester two, we've got lots of interesting electives and also that research activity that I just mentioned. It's a 12 credit point subject. It's a, an optional research project in one of the clinics or the labs at the BMRI. It's a fantastic opportunity to choose your own project, have a supervisor. It's about three days a week and you can really get involved doing your own project and writing up a mini thesis at the end. It's very valuable if you're not so sure if you want to do research or not. You can get a taste for it, find out what it's like and um, hopefully it inspires you uh, to go on to do research later on. Um, this is another one of those testimonials. I think this one touches a little bit on what Ian was talking about before. Some of our students come in with a certain set of expectations and then find that their mind just opens to all these other things. This particular student was really impressed with the um, work on mental health policy, law and the ethics that Ian was mentioning before. And um, she said that the skills that she gained in her research project she'll use in her um, medical profession. So even though she didn't go on to do research, uh, she thinks that those skills are going to be invaluable to her. Just some factual details about applications. Um, the cut-off date for the domestic uh, applicants is the 30th of November and that's all online. So um, we would accept late applications though if they did come through late. This is the fee information which uh, you can also find online and um, fee help which is the new version of HEX. Uh, just one more student testimonial, uh, and this kind of highlights what Ian was speaking about, about the multidisciplinary aspect of this degree. It's really unique in that way, and it really takes people out of the small picture and into the big picture, and um, also challenges them not just to accept what they've been told, but to really critically analyse it and uh, think about you know, how that can be put into practice in the clinical setting or the research world. That's yet another picture of what I've described to you before about the two different streams with the electives or with the research activity. Um, here are some of our career pathways. We're in our fourth year of the degree, so we don't have, you know, a huge amount of years of, of graduates, but it um, can be taken to enhance your clinical practice if you're already working in clinical practice. We have a lot of graduates that have gone on to an MPhil or a PhD and actually a lot of them have stayed with the BMRI which we're really pleased about. They loved it so much they're still there. Um, we've also got um, employment in the mental health industry, particularly policy and um, continuing professional development. And here's just our last slide of some happy graduates. Um, really, I think one of the things that lots of our graduates say to us is that the opportunity to meet leaders in the fields is amazing. We've got a lot of guest lecturers and a lot of the experts that actually work in the building. And, um, you know, every week you get to meet a new expert and, you know, talk to them and challenge them, as Ian said. So it's, it's a really unique experience. So I think that's it.